Hi everyone, and welcome to our additional media offering with the Maine Health Center for Tobacco Independence Training and Education Team. And I'm excited to have you join for the conversation today. For this quarter's soundbite, we're gonna be chatting with a district tobacco prevention partner from Maine. For a little background, the Statewide Tobacco Prevention Services Initiative includes strategies implemented by the Center for Tobacco Independence and 15 community-based subrecipients, also known as District Tobacco Prevention Partners, who focus on three areas, prevention of youth initiation, reducing exposure to secondhand smoke, and promotion of tobacco treatment through the main quit link. Today, I am pleased to welcome one of our 15 prevention partners, Roxanne, who will be answering some questions regarding what community she covers, as well as a more in-depth background of the work that they do. So first off, welcome Roxanne. I appreciate you taking the time to sit down, even though we are still virtual, um, to be able to give folks an idea of what district partners around Maine do. Oh, thank you for giving District Tobacco Prevention Partners an opportunity to share all we do in our communities. Absolutely. So to get started, I thought it would be helpful if you could give everyone a background of what a District Tobacco Prevention Partner is and which community you cover. Great. Um, as you mentioned, there are 15 uh, District Tobacco Prevention Partners across the state. Our team here at Bangor Public Health and Community Services serves both Penobscot and Piscataquis counties, um, which for those of you who may not be aware of how big Maine is, um, that's equal in square miles to Connecticut and Delaware combined. <laughs> the work we do in these two community falls into the three categories that you mentioned. So. Uh, first category, Youth Prevention of Initiation of Tobacco, is where we work with all of our local school districts to provide technical assistance. Um, we help them create tobacco policy and procedures that address all of the school's concerns and that either meet and or even more so exceed all legal requirements as well. We educate administrators, teachers, support staff like our school nurses, um, parents and students too, all about um, tobacco, but we focus particularly on products that are impacting schools, uh, like the epidemic we're experience here, experiencing here in Maine and across the nation with e-cigarettes. We connect them to evidence-based curriculum, uh, that's prevention curriculum and tobacco treatment resources. We also work with youth-serving entities like our YMCAs and children's museums and child care organizations in very similar ways. We recently began supporting uh, our local tobacco retailers too, to help them to educate their staff through a free training program called No Butts. Uh, it provides free signage for their locations um, as well. This was timed recently with a new federal Tobacco 21 law that came into effect. The federal law actually superseded Maine's, which had a grandfathering clause. This caused a lot of confusion for tobacco sellers and consumers. So we were able to offer clear signage and support the retail clerks with language to help explain the age change to their customers. That's fantastic that you're able to provide trainings and support for the organizations in your community, especially to reach the youth population. Yes, the layers of policy, plus curriculum, plus education, and connecting to treatment, they all work together and create a better safety net to protect um, the youth. Uh, category two, as you mentioned above, is preventing exposure to secondhand smoke or aerosol. Uh, aerosol is what we uh, know is emitted from e-cigarette devices. So here in this category, we work with our local colleges, universities, community colleges, career and trade schools, um, to provide, again, technical assistance um, with policy. We do education with resident assistance um, and wellness uh, uh, programs. We provide resources. We connect them to treatment for uh, and trainings for all of their staff. Um, as an example, here in our area, we were able to work with the University of Maine here in Orono to develop and implement a comprehensive tobacco-free campus policy. Uh, that included marijuana and cannabis. And this was subsequently implemented system-wide to support all the main campuses. What a terrific policy and to be able to implement and to have it enforced at other main campuses as well is so exciting. 
Yes, we also, um, under this category two, secondhand smoke exposure, we work with multi-unit housing and lodging on tobacco and uh, smoke-free units by providing lease language and also enforcement tools and strategies. We especially focus um, on family housing since children are more susceptible to the negative effects of secondhand smoke exposure. We work with workplaces um, and workplace and employee policy education around workplace smoking laws and how to connect their employees to tobacco treatment. Uh, one workplace that we partnered with recently was Green Acre Kennel Shop in Bangor, and they were fun. We were able to update their workplace tobacco policy to become a tobacco-free workplace. Uh, we also did an employee training on how to refer um, any of their clients' peoples uh, to the main quit link, and we also participated with a local vet um, on their program, uh, the Green Acre Kennels Wolf Meow Show, uh, talking about the impact of second and third hand smoke on pets in the home. That's so great to hear that your team is able to help organizations connect their employees with tobacco treatment. That's one large barrier that we do see is that folks may not know their resources in their community. So the work that you're doing with workplaces is just wonderful. Oh, thank you. So while our main focus is prevention, uh, we frequently are asked what resources are available in the community for those that would like to become tobacco free. So as you mentioned about uh, category three is, is connecting people to treatment resources. Um, in this category, we work with a variety of community partners, um, such as our hospitals and healthcare organizations, um, behavioral health organizations, social service agencies, and um, as I mentioned above the animal care uh, welfare, uh, animal welfare businesses like Green Acres Kennel that I mentioned above. Um, these organizations have an opportunity through the services that they provide to help connect someone who wants to quit to evidence-based treatment. So while we work on policy and education with these community partners, this is also where their procedures matter the most. So working with these types of partners, our goal is always to encourage tobacco to get addressed within their workflow whether it be an electronic medical record or a client visit. Um, we do that by working with the non-clinical staff who usually set the stage for whatever happens next in the service chain. Yeah, I really like that you mentioned in the workflow because addressing tobacco use can happen at any stage of a visit as well as various organizations. So not just in a physician's office. Um, it's important for people to remember that even non-clinical staff can have a huge um, effect on patient outcomes when they're simply asked about their tobacco use and if they want more information on how to quit. So I really, I really appreciate that you mentioned that. Yes, it's something actually that I learned from the Center for Tobacco Independence. <laughs> Every time a trusted provider asks about tobacco, it is a reminder for the patient of how important it is to their health and well-being. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we will move on to question two. So the next question is, what programs or resources are in your area? Good question. When I first started working in this position, uh, we had requests for presentations about e-cigarettes for parents, school, staff, and youth, but we didn't have the materials. Uh, so our team here designed some PowerPoint presentations to answer the questions we kept hearing. Uh, for example, we heard some parents were allowing use of these products for their kids, believing they contained simply flavored water vapor. Um, this was before these products required a nicotine warning on the package. Uh, so we put in slides with information showing just how much nicotine is in a typical pod and how that compares to other known products and the dangers nicotine poses to still developing brains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great idea to combine frequently asked questions you were receiving because I'm pretty sure, I'm sure many people uh, had the same questions. So I was definitely surprised by how much nicotine is in a typical pod when I first learned about it. So it's fantastic information to be able to present to parents, school staff, and youth. Yes, we work with many community partners um, and each of them are, you know, they have differing concerns around tobacco use. And that's why we put together similar presentations for our university's resident assistants, uh, uh, similar presentations for behavioral health organizations and child care centers. Each 
presentation addressing the unique concerns and questions from each of those entities. And what I greatly appreciate is that over time, our grant funder really listened to what community partners were asking for before developing a resource to share. Um, and having done this work for quite a while now, we have policy toolkits, very professional looking presentations, rat cards, posters, and even social media ready posts um, built upon the requests that we heard and shared from our local communities, which are great resources. And of course, we have data driven resources from data that's gathered. Um, a good example would be the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey. Uh, this is a survey which is done through a Maine DHHS and Maine DOE partnership. And it lets schools know how they are trending in different health categories like youth e-cigarette usage. Mm. Yeah, having the most up-to-date data is such a powerful way to show the trends in youth use especially when it comes to e-cigarettes. So that's great that you're able to collect that information and disseminate it to your communities. So now we'll move on to the third question. What strategies have you been able to implement to prevent tobacco use and exposure? Uh, well, one of, our, one of the big successes was implementing a comprehensive tobacco policy and procedures with the University of Maine here in Orono. And uh, that was, subsequently uh, shared and implemented system-wide for all the campuses. The University of Maine at Orono has been a fantastic leader on this front for many years. Um, so we're very happy to see them take the leadership in that, in that area and share it among all of the, all of the campuses across the state. Uh, other successes, we've worked with a child care organization here uh, that supports nine different child care sites. Um, eight of them were in our service area. They wanted to create uh, not just a smoke-free policy, but a smoke scent-free policy and procedures for all their sites. Uh, the scent piece came uh, from a concern about secondhand tobacco and cannabis smoke clinging to the backpacks and children's clothing that was triggering uh, reactions with staff and other children. So the policy was a terrific collaboration. It met all the needs of the child care sites in one clear document, and we backed it up with educational resources for the, to share with the parents and the staff. Um, other successes in this category we have had with a number of multi-unit landlords um, who have converted their units to smoke-free living spaces too. Wow, what a great policy to be able to implement at child care sites. Oftentimes people are so focused mainly on tobacco and e-cigarette use, but forget about second and third hand smoke. So this policy really is a great reminder for employers to keep in mind the hazards of secondhand smoke, especially around children and pets. So if folks are looking for a connection to resources, you can find the link to the DTPP page on our website next to the link for the recording, as well as in the YouTube description. Um, we do also have another tool around secondhand smoke. Um, it's called the Smoke Free Home Pledge, and it's great for families uh, where someone in the family may smoke or vape but isn't ready to quit just yet. Um, hopefully, this tool can be used to get them to pledge to smoke outside um, to keep family spaces free of second and third hand smoke in the home. Mm. Yeah, that's a great option for individuals who might not be ready to quit. Uh, but want to still make that positive change. So if folks are interested in the smoke-free home pledge, I can also include a link to this in the YouTube description as well. So moving on to the fourth question, what are some of the interventions your program has implemented around prevention of youth initiation? Uh, this is the category of work that I do that I'm most passionate about. Uh, I am a former school board member, so I love a good policy, or <laughs> you're not surprised. Um, and the challenge that we found here was not that there wasn't policy in place, um, all of the schools had something, but that often it wasn't meeting the needs of the school or the students. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting and a great observation. Would you be able to give an example? Sure, um, an example would be when a school uses suspension for a first mm -hmm. offense mm -hmm. when a student violates the tobacco policy. If the student is addicted or dependent on nicotine, a suspension, unfortunately, will not make that addiction go away. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, 
we worked with schools to try to put in place a number of procedures to follow, such as uh, making sure an assessment of nicotine dependence is done for the student, involving parents, um, educating both students and parents on nicotine risks, and also what withdrawal looks like, and a referral to evidence-based treatment. Um, this way, the cycle can be broken. Um, this was never more evident when, than with the cigarette epidemic that we've seen here in the state and nationally because the schools were overwhelmed with the numbers of suspensions and repeat suspensions. So um, unfortunately, suspension alone does not break the cycle of addiction. Right. Yeah, that's such an important concept that I feel like all schools should adopt. Uh, punishment definitely doesn't fix, fix the issue at hand. No, it doesn't. Um, we had schools looking to implement some evidence-based in curriculum that included the dangers of e-cigarettes. And again, when I first started doing this work, there really wasn't much out there. Um, we did do some, some in-depth research and we found a very hopeful program, uh, one called Catch My Breath, which is funded by CVS Health. Uh, we did receive some innovation funding to share with this program with our local schools. And our objective was to get a teacher trained to teach it in the school so it could become sustainable. Um, we've also addressed for schools how to safely dispose of these products, which is not as easy as you might think. Um, and we continue to do presentations with parents and students whenever we're asked. In addition to schools though, we work with local municipalities as well to create tobacco-free parks and playgrounds because this is where, when youth are in school, they're spending a lot of their free time. Um, in our area, both the towns of Orono and BC recently implemented policies protecting all their parks and playgrounds. So not only does this eliminate secondhand smoke exposure in these family-friendly spaces, but it's also a space where children don't see tobacco being used, um, or in other words, healthy role modeling by adults. Yeah, that's such a great point. So not only eliminating the actual smoke and secondhand smoke, but also the opportunity for learned behaviors is so important. So moving on to the fifth and final question. So what are some challenges that you've come across during implementing new strategies in your area? Well, certainly COVID-19 has been a game changer for all of us. Mm -hmm. We've all had to pivot our work to keep ourselves and our com community partners safe. And the pandemic has, to no surprise, been the biggest challenge. Um, so I can an honestly answer it that way. Mm -hmm. But I would say the good news is we have pivoted successfully in many ways. Um, I noticed, you know, we can now zoom into many meetings, um, just like this one, and provide virtual presentations that usually get us an even bigger audience than we would uh, sometimes get in person. Yeah, absolutely. Being able to reach a larger audience with virtual meetings has definitely seemed to be a silver lining, especially for trainings. Yes. Um, so we're all working differently in one way or another. So everyone is generally pretty understanding. Outside of the COVID-19 challenge, though, I would say that tobacco, which is a legal product, if you're 21 or older, is misunderstood by many who see it as low risk. When tobacco use is the number one preventable cause of disease and death in the world, the risks certainly don't seem low. If we talk about main use, you know, currently our cigarette usage is under 10% for the first time in decades, which is a great success. But in that same time frame, e-cigarette usage has risen to roughly 29% across the state, which is another challenge. So. We will always be outspent by tobacco companies, but I, I hope we don't give up. I hope Maine continues to fund tobacco prevention in each county. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think the work that you guys are doing has made and continues to make such an important impact on so many populations from youth in schools to parents um, to educators. I hope so. Um, I will share a success here, which keeps me going. Um, I started in this work in 2017. And in 2017, um, on the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey that we mentioned before, uh, students were asked a question. Uh, if they used an e-cigarette, what was in it? And on that 2017 survey, over 50% believed they were vaping flavored water. Mm -hmm. 
uh, only 25% said nicotine. And like I said, this is when I started this work. Well, two years later, and lots of school presentations from our team here and other district tobacco prevention partners across the state, that question was asked again in 2019 on the same survey, this time with different results. In 2019, 54% answered that they, um, the e-cigarette that they had used uh, contained nicotine and only 25% believed it was flavored water. So the good news I feel is that students are starting to understand that these products are not harmless and they do carry risk. And for the work that we do, this is moving the needle in the right direction. And I hope we can keep it going for the sake of Maine's young people. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think the data just goes to show how incredibly important the work is that district uh, partners are doing. Um, the abundant amount of resources and education you're able to provide to your communities has clearly been beneficial in teaching people the facts about tobacco and providing them with the right resources to quit. Yes, and as you mentioned before, when you asked, you know, what does a district tobacco prevention partner do? We combine layers, mm -hmm. layers of good policies evidence-based curriculum, education, and treatment options, all to provide that community safety net to reduce tobacco exposure. Mm -hmm. Great, well, thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank everyone for tuning in and listening to this episode with a district tobacco prevention partner. I wanted to extend a huge thank you to Roxanne for participating and answering our questions today. We hope you enjoyed our conversation, and if so, please make sure to visit our website, at www.ctimaine.org for the recording and to stay up to date on future episodes. Thank you, everyone.